just like uh, Knut Bunk's team has also, also an anniversary this year. She's been LARPing for 20 years. <laughs> Tina Lisa Lindvall well, started out organizing fantasy LARPs, but went on to other new things like Mad About the Boy, Koi Koi, Screen the Crew. She's also been the co-editor for LARPs from the factory. So, Trina is going to talk to us a little bit about what shaped us before we became LARPers and how that influenced LARP and the LARP scene. And I'm very excited to hear. When I was a little girl, I was fortunate enough to have an older sister who was picked out to play the Blueberry Fairy. Uh, that's her. Some of you might know her today. <laughs> and that was sort of my, the start of my acting career as well. Uh, and throughout my childhood and my youth years, I played a lot of theater. Um, that's me to the right there, playing Jungfru Kluck, <laughs> Lady Clock in uh, Robin Hood. And this was very, very important to me. I played theater all the time uh, and in high school I started specializing in drama and I dreamed of becoming a prof professional actor. Yeah, and then two things happened. <laughs> One thing was that I realized what sort of lifestyle you would have to have as a professional actor or even worse as a wannabe professional actor. <laughs> and I got a boyfriend. <laughs> Some of you might know him as well, because that's the point of this. How does, do these connect? He was a LARPer. Um, and uh, he quickly convinced me to go to a LARP. It was Cubic Genesis, for those who know that, which is almost 20 years ago. And pretty soon after that, he started organizing LARPs with my sister. And I sort of just tagged along in the organizing team as uh, the girlfriend. <laughs> And a year passed, and uh, we broke up. But I had become a LARPer, and a LARP organizer in my own right. And I had parked the dream of being a professional actor, and realized that I could live out my creative creativity through playing and organizing LARPs instead. So why am I telling you this? <laughs> it's because what I brought with me into the LARPing scene what informed my conception of role-playing and collective storytelling was not tabletop role-playing or Lord of the Rings. It was improdrama, drama dance, and theater. And in this talk, I'm going to look at what other fields uh, that have influenced the Nordic LARP scene, and maybe particularly the, Nordic, the Norwegian scene I'm, I've been a part of. So I'm going to look at some questions. What shaped us before we started LARPing? And how has that influenced our LARPs and our LARPing culture? Much of the source material for this talk has been me talking to people in the last few days. So what shaped you then? What did you do? And asking people questions and filling that out with things I knew from before. And I've also had an online discussion with the first uh, organizers and designers of Norwegian LARP in Oslo, that is, not the... Some of the trenders have also contributed. Um, there seems to be some large categories that we can group people into. And the first one is the role players and the fantasy literature uh, readers. These were the people that had read The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings, as I hadn't. Uh, and who played Dungeons and Dragons and Warhammer and all these things. And during the years, they started playing and reading cyberpunk and playing Call of Cthulhu and making that into role-playing games. And for many people I talked to, the appeal of LARPing was to get to live out these stories that they were reading and that they were playing around the table, but to get to live it. And that was why they started LARPing. There were also people who were playing written online games um, in forums and in emails. And they're so also co connected to the people who didn't only read fancy literature but also wrote it themselves. 
<laughs> and it's quite obvious that the role players have been highly influential when it comes to content in the early LARPs, especially. But also the structure, uh, the whole idea of having game masters, uh, the fighting systems, the character sheets that you were given, but also the text heaviness of many LARPs, that you have like pages and pages and pages of reading to do sometimes. As I said, I had been discussing with the first organizers in Oslo, and some of them were scouts. Uh, and they were into tabletop and, and uh, role-playing games, and that was why they started to LARP. But what they also brought with them was knowledge about how to survive in the woods, uh, how to put up tents, how to cook food on a fire, how to build things, so sticks, and other things. And they had good access to scout cabins, which was a plus. And possibly this is the background for why at least Norwegian LARP was often for lasting for many days in the wilderness, far from other people. They were able to do it. And the same group of people were also history nerds. Uh, and from the start in Oslo, they did historical LARPs as well as fancy LARPs. And sometimes that also mixed so that it was historical LARPs with fancy elements. And, and it, this meant that there was a strong emphasis on historical gear and equipment and costumes even if uh, one maybe wouldn't think so from the photos. <laughs> um, but this created a strong focus on what was later dubbed the 360-degree illusion by Jonna Kallian, uh, and gradually cranked the dial up towards the level of realness that was seen at LARPs like 1942 and Once Upon a Time. Then we have another group of people who are the youth activists. They come in many different forms, from like far left, uh, fortunately not too far out on the right side, but past the mid, clearly. Um, and the people who were used to working politically in some way uh, before they started LARPing. Some of them started to, uh, and to actually use LARP as a tool for doing what they were already doing, whereas others sort of matured into making political LARPs. And, yeah. and we could mention a few LARPs here, like America, Europa, Mellom Himmel, Hav, many others. But that's not all they contributed with. Uh, one example is a ways of communication and organizing discussions, like for instance, hand signs. Anybody agree? Um, and others contribute with the knowledge of how to organize us into groups and clubs, run organizations, how to write funding applications, and how to establish formal cooperations uh, between groups, all skills that have shaped us further along the road. The fact that many LARPers had been into political activism before they started LARPing also made them maybe more susceptible to, to supporting uh, others when they uh, wanted to make political LARPs, but that was not a problem. People were already ready for that message. And then you have the people like me, and the people who had overread Keith Johnston's book <laughs> Impro. Uh, and as I started telling you, my background uh, is from amateur theater and theater studies. And how did I use my theater experience in LARPs? To start with, I uh, mostly used it to think of how we could design a sort of like Aristotelian curve uh, story arc in our, uh, in our LARPs and also the campaign that it was like building up from LARP to LARP. I used it a lot in my own character building, uh, focusing a lot on the needs and flaws of, uh, of the characters. That it's not only important to give characters goals, but also parts of their personality that will make them not being able to reach their goals. In a way, I was designing for playing to lose before it was cool. <laughs> but what I dreamed though, though, but I didn't know how to achieve it. It was particularly three things. 
I miss the possibility you have when you're rehearsing for a play to play scenes again and again, to test things out. What happens if I make a pause here? What happens if I say that word in a different way? Uh, what happens if I slam the door in your face? Uh, and to see how that works. I would often go home from LARPs and direct scenes I had lived out in my head, doing them again, like, well, what had happened if we had done that? And uh, such things. But I thought, not going to get that in LARPs. I also missed the possibility of uh, to express and receive more information than I could get in the 360 environment. I wanted monologues and abstraction and symbolism, but alas, I thought, not going to get that in LARP. And the third thing I wanted from the theater world was a theater machine, like a stage with scenography and lights and soundscapes that could be changed around to be whatever we needed it to be. Ah, not going to get that in LARP, I thought. And I was sort of like, yeah. LARP is this, and theater is that, and I'm not doing that anymore. Yeah. Then I went to Knudepunkt in Denmark 10 years ago, and I heard about the LARP, uh, A Nice Evening with a Family, which was to be a mix of LARP, theater, and freeform. And I realized that this was my dream coming true. I was going to play a LARP based on theater pieces, with the possibility of exploring the scenes from the play in a workshop. I, there would be tons of meta techniques to get all the inner monologues and everything out. And there would even be a simple black box with lights and sound. I was in heaven. And a year or two later, I went to Prolog in Sweden and played my first lark in a pr proper black box <laughs> that even had these wooden boxes that we could move around so they, they could be whatever I wanted them to be. I had finally found my theater machine. And I guess we could say that these techniques and methods from the theater medium and from the free from scene has widened our perception of what LARP can be, pretty much. Many people that are here today, they uh, might be used to playing about abstract themes like love and abandonment and fear of death in the black box, but are kind of freaked out by the thought of going into the woods for a weekend. <laughs> so to conclude, what we were into before we became LARPers has had a definite impact on us, on our medium and our culture. These days we are lending to other fields. LARPers bring knowledge and techniques of participatory art into the museums and the schools, the scout movement, the radio theater, in, uh, in interactive theater pieces, and city planning, just to mention a few. Areas that we are now leaving our imprints on, just like they once did with us. Thank you.